Okay, let's see how this goes. The Drave and the Manic Impression. Several days after Wilfried's fate had been decided, Ferdinand summoned me from my temple chambers, having received news from Justice. I had just recently seen Tuli for the first time in ages. She had come by with the Gilberta Company to deliver a new hairpin, and I was so excited to have received a letter from my family that I practically skipped into it. His hidden room. Oh yeah, his hidden room. Only to be scolded when I asked what this was all about. Do you not remember the very reason we were gathering information? We discussed this only a few days ago. I can't spend all my time living in the past, you know. A few days ago was ancient history. Forgetting about things days after they have stopped being relevant to me was just in my nature. I was the same way back on Earth, too. I would pass a test, then forget everything on the syllabus I didn't think was important. In other words, I had a very short and selective memory. There were just so many other more substantial things that I wanted to focus on. The new paper, the new ink, my ink letter from Thule, my next toy for Camille. I simply didn't have enough free time to dwell on stuff that had already happened. This is not a matter of the past, Ferdinand said. The incident before was simply an information gathering exercise for our enemies. In fact, I would say the true attack has yet to come. His unexpected revelation sent me reeling with shock. If that had all just been them gathering information, what in the world was going to happen now? I truly had no idea what went on in the minds of nobles. I could never predict what they were about to do next. Based on the information gathered, we have concluded that they were prodding us to see how we would react. And that's why they were so passive? Indeed, we believe they were testing a variety of things, whose opinion Wilfrey would trust most, how Sylvester would deal with one of his children committing a crime, how those around him would react, how the nobles with an Aaronvest would move, and so on. They had used Wilfrey a child to harass Aaronvest, all so they could sit back and see what happened. This was one nasty plot. Have we determined who it was that pulled such a baffling scheme? We were referring to someone who knows not just the location of the tower, but also how to open it. Someone who does not care to save Veronica. Someone who was targeting Wilfried. Okay, one thing I was actually just thinking about while I was waiting to start this. From what we've heard, Veronica dotes on Wilfried. She cares about him. And that's why he trusts her, her opinion, more than anybody else at the time. So, why didn't she warn him when she saw him? Get out of here. It's not safe here. You're going to commit treason just by being here. If she cared about him that much because she knows that that is a prison she's in. Does she not care about his well-being at all? Because one of the options for his punishment was to be executed. Does she not care that he, if he dies or not? If that's the case, then I feel so bad for Wilfred. But cared not whether he was disinherited or executed as long as it caused problems in Aaronvest. Only the head of one faction in particular would do this. It appeared that Ferdinand had managed to identify our enemies. There was a serious gleam in his black golden eyes. I wish to solidify Aaronvest's defense sooner rather than later. To this end, Rosemine, I ask that you teach me your mana compression method as soon as possible. Like I said before, that can wait until my potion is ready. If everyone else gets a power boost while I'm stuck in this weak body, then I'll be the only one in danger, won't I? My health comes before the mana compression technique. Ferdinand stood up, shaking his head in defeat. Very well, we shall brew the potion tomorrow. Morning in place of your usual duties. Tomorrow? It certainly seems like he's in a rush. And so it was decided that we would make my potion tomorrow from 3rd to 4th bell. Ferdinand would normally make his plans at least three days in advance, but here he was willing to disregard standard working hours and at such short notice. It was probably a testament to just how much danger we were really in. The next day, I was taken straight into Ferdinand's hidden room, just as we had arranged. I spoke to his back as he took out several ing various ingredients and checked his instruments. Ferdinand, could it be that you're in real a really big rush to learn about a mana compression technique? He turned around to face me, looking completely stunned, as though he couldn't believe what I had asked. Then his expression shifted into a grimace. How long does it take for your mana compression method to show results? I have no idea. I used, to sub I used it subconsciously to keep myself alive. Daniel learned it at the end of spring. But to my understanding, his mana was continuing to grow around that time anyway. This is going to be the first time that an adult who is no longer growing uses it. So I genuinely can't say for sure whether it will even have an effect. As I thought, Ferdinand replied, those of us in your inner, inner, inner circle will experiment to see whether or not the method increases our mana capacities. In the case that it does, we shall have members of our faction try it as well, and from then we will teach it to those who join our faction in hopes of getting more mana. But if our wider goal is to increase Aaronfest's overall mana capacity, just how many years might that take? I would like to have made at least some progress before Georgina arrives for her visit next summer. 
It had taken Daniel half a year to increase his mana capacity enough for those around him to notice. But he was an unusual case. Ferdinand wanted to see if the method worked on adults whose capacities weren't still naturally growing. Well, it's not really naturally growing. It was started again thanks to your blessing, which is not natural, but whatever. And how quickly it would show results. But if we wanted to do these tests before Georgine's visit next summer, then we really didn't have much time. I see why you're rushing now. If Georgine was the kind of person to cause as much trouble just to see how we would react, then who knew what would happen if she got serious? This is why I would like to postpone the brewing of your derive if possible. No, absolutely not, I yelled, yell shaking my head. Shaking my head hard. First you said you'd make it when we'd gathered the ingredients. Then you said after Charlotte's baptism, or really after the dedication ritual and spring prayer. And now you're saying we should postpone it till after Georgine's visit? Just how long do you intend to make me wait? The potion brewing comes first, then we could do the mana compression. Caving here wasn't an option. I knew that Ferdinand would just keep postponing it forever otherwise, and I wanted to get healthy again as soon as possible. How stubborn, he muttered. That goes for the both of us. Bub, say whatever you want. I'm not budging on this. I understand that you want to spread my compression technique out of concern that something might happen, but this is the very same reason I want to get healthy. As I am now, I wouldn't even be able to run from danger. I'd just pass out. She's got a point. If you want her healthy, if you want her safe from any kind of danger, then her being healthy would be a very good start to that. Because then at least she'd be able to have a higher chance of getting away. I cared more about my own well-being than expanding other people's mana capacities. Ferdinand himself had said that we didn't know who exactly was being targeted here. And if we wanted to address our weak points first, then my health was an obvious priority. I see. You do have a point, Ferdinand said with a nod, my desperate ranting having finally gotten through to him. He picked up a large box and started making his way out of the hidden room. We need space to brew your potion, so we shall first create a hidden room in your high bishop's chambers. Hmm, why not do it? Just... Just do it here, I asked, looking about his material and instrument-filled room. He turned back to me and did the same. Because there is not enough space in which to work. No. Stored in the room were several large instruments intended for experiments, stacks of parchment, and boards covered with research notes, and so many materials that even a single shelf was completely full. Ferdinand had a point. There was simply too much stuff. Plus, unlike my current hidden room, only those with a certain level of mana could enter. That meant cleaning attendants were unable to go inside, which was unideal since Ferdinand's hidden room always ended up a huge mess like this whenever he had a breakthrough with his research or discovered some new material. In any case, you will need a hidden room to sleep in when you consume, when you consume the potion. It does not even require that much effort to create a hidden room large enough for our purposes, so I would rather you simply get it over with. I apparently needed a hidden room with a barrier of my own for safety's sake, since we knew that using the derive would put me to sleep for a lengthy period of time. How big does the room need to be, I asked. One as large as your room will do. Only you and I will register our mana with it. We need at least one person capable of entering your room while you are asleep. And so I made a hidden room in my high bishop's chambers. It wasn't a very nerve-wracking experience, given that I had already done the same thing in the orphanage and the monastery. I placed my left hand, the one on which I wore my magic ring, on the face stone built into the door leading inside and poured my mana into it. Once the door had my mana, a magic circle shining with pale blue light rose above it. I poured my mana in it, registering it with the face stone, at which point a red light began to streak through the magic circle. The same red light circled my wrist, forming various complex patterns and letters. I'll never get tired of seeing all this fantasy-esque stuff. It really gets my heart racing. I excitedly watched as the mana coursed through the magic circle, at which point Ferdinand placed his hand onto mine and began pouring his mana in as well. Only then did I remember him mentioning that we would both be registering ourselves this time. The red light streaking through the magic circle shone brighter, perhaps due to the additional mana. Actually, how does registering two people's mana at once even work? As I tilted my head, Ferdinand gripped his staff with his right hand while standing behind me and said, Stylo. His, sta his staff turned into a pen, which he then touched against the magic circle. The letters written in red started to disappear and reappear, moving all around as though they were dancing. Some letters jumped away from the magic circle, buzzing in the air, bursting in the air like small explosions. He was using his staff to manipulate them and gradually rewrite the magic circle, and the sight was so strangely beautiful that I was desperate to try it out myself. Not now. Not until you do the Royal Academy stuff. Ferdinand, it's incredible how you can manipulate the letters like this. Can you teach me to write the magic circles too? That will have to wait until you get a staff of your own. Aww. I slumped my shoulders sadly. It seemed that my days of writing cool magic circles in the air wouldn't come anytime soon. Ferdinand gave a nod. That should do. With everything completed, he handed out bro handed out brooches with face stones in them for his attendants to wear. 
There were apparently magic tools signifying that the wearer had permission to enter the High Bishop's hidden room, and the attendants who put them on busily started moving boxes packed with materials into each and such inside. Line that box up against the wall, Ferdinand said, giving his attendants instructions while spreading out a large cloth in the center of the room. At a glance, the magic circle on it resembled the teleportation circle that tax officials used during the Harvest Festival. Ferdinand, is this a teleportation circle? It looks like a lot like the ones used for taxes. No, it's so it is something similar. Step back. Ferdinand moved me away from the circle, then poured mana into it. It seemed that while the magic circle used for taxes was for sending items to the castle, this one was for tr retrieving items from elsewhere. He stuck his hand inside and began pulling out various things. Wow, we he's like the English nanny from those popular children's books. What from uh, Mary Poppins? Oh my god, that actually does make sense. Yeah, yeah, she's talking about the she's talking about Mary Poppins. Out came a box large enough to be a stone bathtub, a cauldron big enough to hold my entire body, a long metal stick resembling an oar, a large table, and several more boxes. Ferdinand's attendants carried away each item as it appeared. This is supposed to be my hidden room, but it almost looks like it's turning into a second workshop for you, Ferdinand. Actually, this is your workshop. You will need one for when you enter the Royal Academy regardless, so I saw little harm in establishing it now. Just hearing that I now had a workshop was enough to get me pumped. My dreams of the future swelled as I thought about adding bookshelves to fill with documents or even going one step further and adding beautiful, beautiful, high-density mob mobile shelving like all the fancy libraries had now. Rosemine, return from whatever fantasies you were caught up in and put the seasonal ingredients that you collected into the mixing cauldron, Ferdinand said, interrupting my elaborate planning of my future workshop to point at the large cauldron. I would apparently be mixing the ingredients with my mana. That's one large cauldron. I could easily fit inside it. What? Would you like me to boil you? <laughs> no, no. Would you like me to boil I can't say it. Would you like me to boil you? I actually managed to get it out. Ferdinand asked an actual serious look in his eyes. I hurriedly shook my head. No, I wouldn't be edible no matter how much you cooked me. I have no intention of eating you and suffering the enormous stomach ache you would no doubt give me. Rather, I was thinking about the high quality mana I could harvest from you. That's even scarier. Eyeing Ferdinand cautiously, I undid the decorative cord on my sash and set it aside. I then wrapped my sleeve up so they wouldn't get in the way and stepped onto a wooden box to increase my height. In front of me was the large cauldron, and in my hand was an oar-like spatula. All I needed was a bandana on my head, and I would have looked just like a school lunch lady. Put in the face stones you gathered into the cauldron one by one, starting with the spring ingredient, and then continuing in chronological order, Ferdinand explained. Wait until each face stone melts before placing the next one in. I followed his instructions, placing the green face stone I made from Ryren nectar into the cauldron before beginning to stir the contents. I could already feel the large spatula absorbing my mana. Could it be that brewing a potion actually requires a lot of mana, I asked? Yes, depending on the quality of the potion and the quantity produced, Ferdinand replied curtly using balanced scales to measure the non-face stone ingredients. I could only see him side on, but it was still clear that he didn't want me bothering him. There was a rare sparkle in his eyes as he measured the ingredients, making it apparent just how much fun he was having with this experiment. There were no two ways about it. He was completely absorbed in his hobby. I, on the other hand, had already grown tired of making the potion. I was quite literally just standing atop a box and stirring the cauldron. It was boring. Aside from the face stone making clinking noises as it moved about inside, nothing was happening at all. How long do I have to do this? My thoughts began to wander, and that was when the face stone abruptly started to melt. It drooped like molten metal sticking to the bottom of the cauldron. Uh, Ferdinand, the face stone melted. Put the next one in and continue to stir. I did exactly that, dropping in the blue face stone that I had made from the race falk egg. It didn't make any noise due to the melted melted green face stone covering the cauldron, which also made it harder to move the spatula. Stir, 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 stir. Perhaps due to the green face stone having melted, the blue face stone started melting sooner than I expected. Once it had broken down, I added the Ruel face stone, and then finally the Snae Sturm face stone. Face stone. Blah, 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 blah. Stir, 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 stir. Ferdinand, my arms hurt. Endure it. You are the one who wished to make the Jareev as soon as possible. Ferdinand dismissed my complaints without a second thought as he peered into the cauldron, tossing in various ingredients that I had never seen before, one after another. They had been chopped into tiny bits so that they would mix together better, which made this whole experience feel a lot more like cooking. Given how methodical and precise Ferdinand was being here, perhaps he had it in him to be quite the excellent chef. Possibly. Stir, stir, stir. Stir, stir, stir. I would like to rest for a little while, I said. No, it is almost done, Ferdinand replied, taking a small jar from a box 
and pouring the thick black liquid inside the cauldron. I was surprised to see him adding something so dark into the vibrant four-colored mixture, but it didn't seem to change the potion by even a shade. I took a closer look, wondering why this was the case, when the liquid in the cauldron started to rapidly expand out of nowhere. Eve, is it going to spell out? Do you truly think I would add enough for that to happen? Do not get so surprised over every step of the process. But the potion's gone from just barely covering the bottom to taking up like 80% of the cauldron all in mere moments. That surprised anyone. I mean, there's no way I can drink this much, I yelled, pointing wildly at the concoction. I had assumed we'd be making a little extra for a reserve potion, but I certainly didn't need this much. This is a bathing potion. Ferdinand gave a casual shrug. You will drink half a glass or so, but a derive is generally not something that you consume. Rather, it is something that you immerse yourself in, he said, gesturing over to the ivory-colored stone box. The completed potion would apparently be poured into it, and then I was supposed to sleep inside. This was certainly an unexpected development. Every potion I had encountered up to this point simply needed to be consumed, and with Ferdinand carrying a reserve to reeve on his belt as we spoke, I had assumed this would be no different. I won't drown? You have nothing to fear. I have never heard of anyone drowning while using a derive. More importantly, though, you have stopped mixing. We are just adding the finishing touches, so you must not slack here. As I got back to stirring the cauldron, Ferdinand added a drop of some other potion. It plopped into the middle of the concoction, which flashed brightly and then turned light blue. There, it is complete. Now it can be used at any time. With that, Ferdinand put a lid on the cauldron. He then covered it with a cloth that had a magic circle on it, which would apparently stop the potion from spoiling or reducing in quality. He sure had a lot of strange yet convenient tools lying around. I wanted to see a complete list of everything he had at some point. Ferdinand, how long am I going to be asleep after I use the derive? For you, I expect anywhere from a month to a season, but no exact predictions can be made. That is why I recommend you get your affairs in order ahead of time, just such that even a long rest will not interfere with your business. My affairs, like write letters to my family and give instructions to my attendants? Correct. As your guardian, I shall be taking over all printing industry-related matters while you are asleep. Contact Benno to ensure that this will not introduce any problems. My family would no doubt be shocked to learn that I was going to be asleep for maybe even a full season. I would need to give Lutz a letter describing the whole situation before I use the derive. Wilma could manage the orphanage on her own, while Fran and Zahn would surely be able to take care of all the attendant-related matters. It was leaving the workshop that I was most concerned about, but I doubted the industry would expand much while I was asleep. Gil and Fritz would simply be preparing stories to be printed, so I couldn't imagine they would come across any problems. While I was counting on my fingers everything that I would need to prepare before using the derive next spring, as we had previously arranged, Ferdinand gave me an annoyed glare. I have finished your derive as promised, and that will have to be enough for you, he said. We are going to the castle tomorrow. Are the contracts all prepared? Yes, just because your own plan just because your own planning and forward thinking skills are poor, do not assume that some mine are as well. Ooh. And so urged on by Ferdinand, I went straight to teaching everyone my monocompression method during the afternoon the next day. Sylvester's office was cleared of everyone but those who will be learning the technique, and multiple boxes, capes, bags, and irons had been prepared just as I requested. There were ten of us in total. Me, Ferdinand, the Archduke couple, that's four. Card says family, I think that's five. That's nine. And finally, Daniel, since he also needed to sign a magic contract. That's ten. Now then, please sign your contracts. Well, everyone signed the contracts agreeing not to become my enemy or teach the monic impression method to everyone else. I started collecting their money. Arch nobles were charged two large golds each, with my future plan being to charge med nobles eight small golds and lay nobles two small golds. These prices would, of course, be halved from the second purchase onward in each family. When I told Sylvester that half of whatever I made would go straight to Aaronvest, in part to pay for the magic contracts, he practically wept with joy. Daniel didn't need to pay, so he was simply signing a contract as a guarantee that he wouldn't spread my technique. Once all that was done, I began my explanation. If you would all be so kind as to help, Daniel, it would be much appreciated. I demonstrated my mana compression method the same way I had with Daniel, stuffing a spread out cape into a box, making it as compact as I could, and calling that the traditional method, then showing that they could fit even more into the box by folding the cape and explaining that this was how they should go about compressing their mana. I see, your visual example sure makes it easy to understand, and I feel like it'd make it easier to compress mana too, Sylvester said, closing his eyes and trying it for himself. Do you think it would also allow adults who have already passed their growth period to increase their mana capacity, I asked? Seems like it, he replied, the excitement clear in his voice. Sylvester had never actually folded a cape before, but after visually demonstrating the process and helping him to imagine it, he found it surprisingly easy to compare presses on his mana. Cardstead and Elvira had their eyes closed and were focusing on doing the same. 
I am told that if you compress your mana too rapidly, you will essentially become drunk on it and feel sick, I said, so please don't push yourselves. It was important to compress just a little bit of mana to free up some space and then compress the new mana that flowed into that space. Repeating this process would increase your overall mana capacity. That said, Daniel had mentioned that boosting the density of mana in your body too rapidly would make you sick. I was unwell and collapsed so often that it was hard to tell whether or not I also experienced mana sickness, but it was undoubtedly the case that compressing mana wasn't good for the body. Daniel had pushed himself exceptionally, especially hard since he needed more mana by next summer, but under normal circumstances, one would want to gradually increase their mana density to give their body time to adjust. It seems like even I will be able to increase my mana capacity with this, Edgar commented. Wow, wow, Lampre explained. Exclaimed, seems like I had a lot more space than I thought. I'm going to use this and get a ton more mana than the both of you, Cornelius added. The three of them were st wore stunned expressions as they moved about their mana. They were all rich archnoble children with attendants, meaning that they too had never folded their own case before. Forceful stuffing was the only mental image they had known, which meant my compression method would work especially well for them. While everyone else reacted to the new mono compression technique with pleasant surprise, Ferdinand alone shook his head with a frown. Unfortunately, it does not seem to be having much of an effect on me. He had already been using a similar mental image to compress his mana, exactly what I would have expected from someone so serious and methodical. It seemed that during his stay in the Royal Academy, he had experimented extensively to increase his mana capacity as much as possible. In that case, I shall teach you the next step, I said, the knowledge that Ferdinand hadn't expected there to be more bringing a grin to my face. I placed several of the folded capes into a bag, climbing onto it, and crushing the capes down. Ferdinand's eyes widened as he watched the bag compress to less than half its former size. So, Ferdinand, what do you think? This is the Rosemine Mana Compression Method. Hmm. I shall try it. With that, Ferdinand closed his eyes and began compressing his mana. Then, after a period of focus, intense enough for beads of sweat to have formed along his brow, he suddenly reached for a potion on his belt and started drinking it. No sooner was it all gone than he closed his eyes again and remained fo return resumed focusing. What did you drink, Ferdinand? What did you drink, Ferdinand? A Mana Restoration Potion. I compressed my mana without first completely filling the space, he said, speaking as though it was obvious. My cheeks twitched. Isn't that, like, super terrible for your body? I just said that compressing your mana too much would make you feel sick. So why are you doing something so dangerous? In fact, why would you ever do something like that after I specifically put so many conditions in the magic contract to make things safer? Even Daniel had gotten mana sickness from the method, subsequently having to wait for his mana to recover naturally. What was Ferdinand thinking using potions to recover on the spot? Despite my obvious frustration, Ferdinand merely waved a dismissive hand in my direction. It will stop. I will stop if I feel there is any danger. There is nothing to worry about, he said, immediately focusing himself again. I had so little to do while everyone was compressing their mana that I started ironing the capes I had previously stuffed into the boxes. Ferdinand opened his eyes around the time I had finished ironing my third one, letting out a slow silo, looking at me with a conflicted expression. You are quite strong, Rosemine, mentally speaking. What do you mean? It requires back-breaking effort to compress mana as much as you do, he said, scratching his head fr hair frustratedly. When I examined his face more closely, I realized he actually looked a little sick, though it was rather subtle. I told you! Furled my brow, at which point he started tapping his temple. They are just my personal observations, but I believe one's mental fortitude will largely determine how much mana can be compressed to this method. He continued, for one, it will not necessarily result in change. Knowing the method will mean nothing if you do not have the mental fortitude to execute it. Furthermore, due to it rapidly changing the density of your mana, it would be best to gradually increase the density over a longer period. Doubling the density with the Rosemine method in such a short time span is quite a sickening experience. It will require an extensive amount of time for me to grow, one to grow accustomed to. For a moment, I couldn't tell whether Ferdinand was actually being serious, but the look on his face told me that he was. My eyebrows shot up in anger. Didn't I say pretty much all of that before we started? Do you just not listen when people speak to you, Ferdinand? Are you actually a fool yourself? Someone please give me a Harrison right now. <laughs> just smack him over the head with it. <laughs> it would be some time before the results became apparent, but apparent, nonetheless, the core members of errant leaders of Aaronfest all continued to compress their mana. Charlotte's Baptism Ceremony on top of my usual yearly duties, handling winter preparation for the orphanage and my chambers, arranging winter handiwork, 
and making the necessary printing arrangements, I now had to rigorously study winter socializing under Ferdinand, teach my monocompression method to the Archducal family's guard knights, and a part of the knight's order, and study baptism baptismal practices day and night to grant Charlotte's first wish. I was absolutely pooped. Ferdinand was going to handle the Bonner registration medals and speak from the Bible, but noble baptism ceremonies were a lot more involved than lower city ones. Not to mention, this was a baptism being held during winter socializing when all the nobles in Ehrenfest were gathering together. I was becoming more tense by the day, determined not to fail. And in the end, I managed to learn everything that I needed to. I worked so, so very hard to the point that my head was now a complete mess. But I had no intention of letting Charlotte know how much this had drained me. Why? Because I wouldn't act all cool and casual about it. I wanted her to be like, wow, you're so cool, big sister. Autumn ended with me nearly being work having worked myself to death, and then came winter. The lower city's winter baptism was held amid the following snow. It was then that I genuinely started to believe the gods of this world were real because, wow, they sure were rewarding me for working so hard. Despite the cold weather, my family had come to the doors of the temple. They peered inside with worried expressions, a warmly wrapped kamio wobbling around, about around them. Wow, look everyone, my little brother is adorable. In fact, he's so cute that I'm worried someone might kidnap him. Because, I mean, I want to kidnap him. I'm a kidnapper, it's me. Look at these precious little cheeks. Praise be to the gods. A single glance at Kamiya wiped away all of my exhaustion. He even looked up at me and waved his hand about. Oh, it's so cute. Tuli had probably gotten him to do that, but I didn't care. He was waving me goodbye. Ah, oh, jeez, what should I do? I'm so excited I don't even think I can make it back to my room. As I trembled to pop top the staircase shrine, overcome with emotion, some great priests mercilessly shut the doors. But even then, I could still see my little brother's overwhelming cuteness when I closed my eyes. Rosemine, do not stand there in a daze. Return to your chambers. Oh, Ferdinand, all this excitement is making my head spin. I need a moment to rest. I leaned against the podium on which the Bible was usually placed and felt the pleasant chill of the ivory stonework. As it cooled me down, I shut my eyes and started to digest just how adorable my little brother was. You are too excited to move? Ferdinand asked incredulously, how much of a fool are you? Oh, shut up. He was the last person I wanted to lecture from right now. He looked as though he was suffering from a serious mana hangover, no doubt having used my compression method too much. Either way, though, I was serious about not being able to move. If you wish to rest, drink a potion and return to your chambers. At this rate, you will not recover in time for Charlotte's baptism ceremony. Well, we don't want that. I opened my eyes again, only to see a scary-looking Ferdinand right in front of me. Yeep! Jesus, dude, you trying to give her a heart attack? He picked me up so suddenly that I jerked in surprise, then he climbed down the staircase and handed me over to Fran, who was worriedly waiting at the bottom. Fran, ensure that she recovers before it is time to depart for the castle. As you wish, Fran replied with a diligent nod, walking away with me in his arms. As soon as we were back in my chambers, I was made to drink a potion and then sent to bed with a collection of wooden boards, all of which contained essential details about the baptism ceremony. There is also reading material available, so rest in bed at your leisure until it is time to leave. Okay. I picked up one of the wooden boards and started to read. It was impossible to defy Fran when he wore such a chilly smile. And so days passed with me doing nothing but studying for the baptism ceremony and giving instructions to people. Before I knew it, it was time for us to leave for the castle. I thought the baptism ceremonies were held around the same time, but I guess not. This year we were going to arrive the day before the baptism ceremony. Fran had mentioned that this was due to Ferdinand delaying our departure for as long as possible, since he imagined that I would find it easier to relax in the temple than the castle. Thanks to him, I could take on Charlotte's baptism ceremony at full strength. Riarda and Aunt Tilly changed to me into my ceremonial high bishop robes first thing in the morning. Then after making sure my new hair stick from Tully was properly in place, I exited my room. I arrived at the Grand Hall even earlier than last year, making sure I was there before Charlotte and was promptly taken to a waiting room. Cornelius was serving as my guard knight, wearing his Royal Academy cape and brooch. The front gate to the castle's main building was visible through the waiting room window, and I could see carriage after carriage starting to arrive. Nobles and their families would stay at, step out of one carriage, with their attendants alighting from another close behind. Some of those attendants, presumably the music teachers, were carrying instruments. There certainly are a lot of people, I murmured. The nobles' influx is only natural since all of the nobles in Ehrenfest gather on the first and last days, Cornelius said with a small smile as he too looked at the window. High beasts were swooping down from the sky and landing as well, making things even more crowded. I can imagine that the Grand Hall was already filled with people. I see you have arrived, Rosemine. Fernand entered the room also wearing his ceremonial robes. There was a brief period of waiting before a scholar came to get us, announcing that it was time for our appearance in the Grand Hall. 
when I entered with Ferdinand, everything was set up the same way as the year before, with the altar in the middle of the stage. The audience was again divided down the middle on the left, far up facing the stage with the archducal couple and their retainers. On the right were the musicians with harp spiels and the families of the kids to be baptized with their magic rings. The two of us walked down the center of the grand hall, Ferdinand taking a single step for every three or four of mine. We climbed up the stage and sat down, at which point he grumbled something about how slow I was. Oh, shut up. It was a bit late for him to be complaining about that, though. Sylvester the Archduke climbed up the stage once we were seated. Once again, Abaglade, the god of life, has hidden away Gadul, the goddess of earth. We must all pray for the return of spring, he announced, marking the beginning of winter socializing. The nobles held up their shining staps and prayed for the goddess of spring to heal as soon as possible. Sylvester then discussed the incident during Autumn's hunting tournament and the resulting punishments. He announced that Wilfred was no longer guaranteed to become the next Ob, that his memories had been searched, and that the guilty nobles had been punished. The punishments themselves weren't particularly severe since the nobles had acted within a legal gray area without committing any substantial crimes. There was a demotion here, a pay drop, and a fine there, but they were being revealed as criminals to all of noble society, and everyone knew this would erase their chances of receiving important positions or promotions henceforth. That would serve as their true punishment. Once the detailed reports were over, it was finally time for the baptism ceremony and winter debuts. The Archduke returned to the audience while I moved to the center of the stage and stepped up onto the box prepared for me, taking care not to tread on my robe. Ferdinand then came up next to me. We welcome the new children of Aaronfest, he said, his voice resounding through the Grand Hall. The musicians all started to play at once, and the main door slowly opened and the children lined up behind them started walking inside. Charlotte, as a daughter of the Archduke, was at the very front. I could see her expression stiffen as she noticed all the eyes on her. Charlotte was wearing what one would expect for a winter baptism, warm, fluffy white clothes, the decorations and embroidery of which were red, the divine colors of winter. Her red collar made her made of wool, and the red flowers on the hair stick I had lent her made her blonde, almost silver hair stand out even more than usual. Her worried indigo eyes fell on me, and I returned a small smile. Do your best, Charlotte. I'll be doing my best, too. The children briefly stopped in front of the stage. I gestured for them to climb up, maintaining eye contact with Charlotte as they all formed a line. Eleven children had their baptism ceremonies this year, five of whom were being baptized now. The process was largely the same as last year, the main difference being that I was performing the ceremony as High Bishop. Ferdinand's voice sound res resounded clearly through the, up the Grand Hall as he regaled the audience with tales from the Bible. When he was done, I called the children over one at a time, starting with the lay nobles and ending with my dear little sister. Charlotte, I said, and she approached with a happy smile. I pinched the mana detecting magic tool between the pieces of mana blocking leather and held it out. She gripped it and the watching nobles applauded as it began to shine. I then took out a metal, pressing the magic tool against it like a stamp to register a mana to it. Five gods have granted you their divine protection, light, water, fire, wind, and earth. If you dedicate yourself to becoming worthy of this protection, you will surely receive many more blessings. What's the? Why didn't you ask Ferdinand about your own before all this? Ask him about it after. I'd like to know. Once the mono registration was complete, Ferdinand briskly took the medal and placed it on the in the organized box. At the same time, Sylvester climbed up onto the stage carrying a magic ring used for emitting mana. He slid it onto Charlotte's finger with a gentle smile and no doubt overjoyed at how much his beloved daughter had grown. I grant this ring to you, Charlotte, now that you have been recognized by the gods and the people as my daughter. Congratulations. I thank you ever so much, Father. Charlotte happily stroked the red face stone ring that was now on her left middle finger. Sylvester raised his head, his eyes signaling for me to continue as I nodded and gave Charlotte a blessing. May Gadul, the goddess of earth, bless you, Charlotte. With that, the red light of a blessing is shot from my ring and onto her. In truth, these blessings have proven harder than anything else I had needed to practice for this baptism ceremony, since it was extremely difficult for me to adjust how much mana I put into them. According to Ferdinand, my emotions had a considerable impact on my blessings, for better or worse. Had I not restrained myself, then I would have been subconsciously given Charlotte a much larger blessing than the other noble children. Such favoritism wouldn't be acceptable for the High Bishop at a baptism ceremony, so I had been forced to spend a ton of time learning to exercise more control. My training had evidently been successful, though, as I ended up giving her a blessing that was pretty much equivalent to the ones everyone else received. I internally let out a sigh of relief. This time, Charlotte poured mana into her own ring, and the floaty red light flew my way as she thanked me for the blessing. The crowd of nobles clapped at the spectacle, and thus ended my little sister's baptism ceremony. Now then, we shall offer our prayers to the gods and dedicate our music to them. 
The winter debut followed the baptism ceremony. We will be rejoicing over the baptized children entering noble society, praying for the gods to continue providing their divine protection, and playing Harshville while singing in dedication to them. A chair was placed in the middle of the stage, and just like last year, the lay noble children were the first to perform. I would call a name, and the summoned child would nervously come and sit down. Their music teacher would then bring up their Harshville and hand it to them with brief words of encouragement. At the end of each performance, I would give the same response. You have done well. The gods are surely rejoicing. I would then call up the next child, all the while sweating at the thought of accidentally mixing up their names in the order in which they perform. Charlotte, I eventually called, as the Archnoble Archduke's daughter. Her performance came last. She sat in the chair, accepted her harsh feel, and then got in position. Ooh, she's good. That's my little sister for you. Unlike Wilfried, who had just barely scraped by after skipping out on years of practice, Charlotte had clearly taken her studies as a child of the Archduke quite seriously. Her playing was exceptionally beautiful, and as her older sister, I would need to continue practicing myself so I didn't fall behind. You have done very well, I said. The gods are surely rejoicing. Thank you. With that, Charlotte descended the stage, thus ending the, ending the winter debut. Ferdinand delivered the closing words, and the two of us exited the grand hall together. Ferdinand, my lady, we must get you both changed during the gifting ceremony, Riarda said. Our work was done as high bishop and high priest, but now we needed to participate in society as nobles. The gifting ceremony had nothing to do with us, since it was simply when the Archduke gave capes and brooches to the new students going to the Royal Academy, which meant it was an ideal opportunity for us to get ready. After the ceremony, they would announce when the students were about due to leave for the Royal Academy, so Daniel and Bridget were currently serving as my garden knights. Hurry, everyone, Rihanna barked while briskly walking forward, compelling Daniel and Bridget to start jogging down the hall. I made Leslie move faster as well to keep up with them. We entered the room and found Ottilie waiting with my clothes ready. She and Rihanna took me out of my high bishop robes and then changed me into an outfit that was predominantly red. Come now, my lady, you must hurry. Once my hair had been smoothed down and my hair stick was put back in... Riarda practically drove me out of the room. I got into my high beast and sped to the dining hall where lunch was being prepared. You did wonderfully as the high bishop. Lady Charlotte is surely overjoyed if Riarda praised, and so I entered the dining hall with a goofy grin on my face. The gifting ceremony was complete and everyone was waiting for my arrival. My apologies for the wait, I said as I took my seat. Worry not, Rosemine, it was Charlotte who so desperately begged for you to be the one to bless her during her baptism. Preparing in time was quite the ordeal, was it not? Florencia asked with a kind smile, commending my efforts. Not at all. I would do anything to grant the request of my darling little sister, I replied with an elegant smile and a shake of my head. In reality, it, had, it really had been an ordeal. So much so, in fact, that I felt half dead while performing the ceremony. But I put my all into it nonetheless entirely so that I could secure the praise and respect of my cute little sister. You were an excellent High Bishop, Rosemine, and so lovely, Charlotte said, her indigo eyes sparkling with admiration. I hope to be just like you one day. Yes, this is what I wanted. My hard work has been rewarded. After lunch, we returned to the Grand Hall to begin socializing. This was when we exchanged greetings with the adults. I had missed out on the socializing last year, granting a huge blessing during my debut had resulted in lunch and the gifting ceremony being swapped around, and then I was promptly scooted out before the nobles could greet me. This year, however, my attendance was mandatory. We three children of the Archduke needed to travel the hall together to show the other nobles that, despite the issues we'll free to cause... There were absolutely no problems between us. I looked around to see all the nobles laughing in conversation, then hurriedly clutched my stomach. It wasn't that I had eaten too much during lunch. Rather, it was hurting from the stress of thinking about what was coming next. Just how many people in here are my enemies? Mother's list couldn't have covered them all, and enemies I don't know about are absolutely the scariest. While I had memorized every name on the list that Elvira had given me, I hadn't yet paired them with faces. Wilfried and Charlotte had also been given lists covering the former members of the Veronica faction, but it was unlikely they had managed to memorize all the names in such a short span of time. Lady Rosemine, Lord Wilfried, Lady Charlotte, I wish you all a good afternoon. We started off greeting members of the Florencia faction and making casual conversations, so the pain in my stomach less eased a little. It helped that I was putting my all into this so, as Charlotte's older sister. I needed to be her guide into women's society. But after we had finished speaking to those in the Florencia faction and started talking to the nobles prodding for information about the hunting tournament incident, well, my stomach was in constant agony. Nobles would approach Wilfried with wide grins spread across their faces, but I would step forward to block them, shielding him and Charlotte behind my back while giving the standard formal greetings. I didn't fail to keep up my elegant smile even when I knew they were speaking to we were speaking to were on the blacklist. We are anxious that a soft cloth has drifted to the ivory tower. 
and nobles would say, to which I would reply, she's sorry the goddess of wind protected him such that he would not leap out from beneath the lion. Isn't that right, Wilfrid? This prompted them to leave with a bemused, ah, I see, but the thought of more conversation like that coming one after another made me feel sick. Rosemine, what was that noble saying? Wilfrid asked me quietly, despite having nodded along in agreement just a second ago. I looked around to make sure that our guard knights were surrounding us before we sprang back. They're wondering if you meeting with Lady Veronica in the Ivory Tower is a sign that you joined the former Veronica faction. What did you tell them, dear sister? Charlotte asked. That there was obviously no chance Wilfrid would ever leave Ob Erinfest. Wilfrid simply blinked at me. That's confusing. Why do you think euphemisms like that? Why do you know euphemisms like that, Rosemine? Because Ferdinand ha beat them into my head, specifically for today. He had told me to stand in the line of fire since Wilfrid didn't understand the euphemisms and Charlotte had no prior experience speaking with nobles due to having only just been baptized. It was my job to handle these interactions in their place, which meant learning all sorts of subtle insults and ironic expressions that they, those here would most likely be using to refer to the incident. All because of my mistake, Wilfrey murmured, visibly frustrated. Forgive me. Um, Rosemine, did my request perhaps put you in a difficult situation? Charlotte asked. Oh, don't worry about it, I replied to Charlotte. This was all something I needed to learn sooner or later as the High Bishop. Despite my attendants and guardians surrounding us, the socializing continued to be painfully stressful, but it eventually came to an end, thank goodness. And as we were enjoying the delicious-looking food that was lined up in the Grand Hall, Seventh Bell mercifully, mercilessly rang. We should be taking our leave. It is now time for the adults to converse. Yeah, mother, father, please excuse us. Good job today. May you sleep well with Slav Trom's blessing. I'm guessing that's like the god of dreams or goddess of dreams or something. After exchanging the noble form of good night with the archduke couple, we started heading toward the doors heading out of the grand hall, all the while performing the same greeting with those we passed. We happened upon Bonifacius on the way out, so I called out to him. Good evening, Lord Bonifacius. May you sleep well with Schlaufram's sh sh blessing. Thank you. I guess it's going to be a hard one to pronounce. The three of us continued saying good night to those we knew until we eventually exited the grand hall. We had one attendant and four guard knights each, and I felt my heart lighten just from knowing that nobody was staring at us anymore. I'm glad that ended safely, I said. That should be the most time we spend around adults for a good while. Right, tomorrow's car in the playroom, Wil Wilfried added. I'll show you how much I've improved after a, year, a whole year of training. I've improved too, and so has everyone else, dear brother. I explained to Charlotte what the playroom was like, was like as we walked through the main building and started making our way to the northern building. But when we were between the two... Something caught my eye. I could have sworn that I saw a window move slightly. Uh-oh. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, what is it, Lady Rose? My Daniel asked. I believe that window just moved. Would you take a closer look for me? As you wish. I'm sure, that wasn't my d I'm sure it was just my imagination, I reassured Charlotte, but I had Daniel check things out just in case. It's unlocked, he muttered, but no sooner had the words escaped him than the window was flung open. Here we go. I knew this was gonna, it, something was gonna happen. I just didn't know what it was. Two adults covered entirely in black cloth leaped into the castle, weapons in hand. Eep, who are these people? The guard knights moved at once to protect their charges, turning their staps into weapons and circling the sta the attackers to block them in. They glared at the intruders who glowered back in turn. Charlotte and I were on the side closer to the northern building, but Warfoo was closer to the main building. We were separated. Lead this to us. Half attack, half defend. Damel and Bridget joined with two of the guard knights protecting Charlotte and two protecting Wilfred. Then they all charged the attackers with their weapons drawn. Starting a chaotic brawl. Wilfried ran to the main building and called for help, I yelled. Lamprit, hurry. In an instant, Oswald picked up Wilfried and rushed toward the main building. Lamprit with another and another guard followed after them, weapons in hand. Rosemine, we should hurry to the northern building. There's a barrier there. I hurriedly turned around and saw two of Charlotte's guard knights running to the northern building with her, leaving having no doubt been trained to flee in times of danger. But right now, we didn't have any knights who could respond to new attackers. Sweat trickled down my cheeks. I undid my seatbelt and leaned out the window of my panda bus to yell again, Charlotte, wait, it's dangerous. Moments before Charlotte reached the hall to the northern building, there were more attackers clad in black leaped through another window. The two guard knights defending her responded instantly, but there was no one to stop the third attacker from picking her up and leaping back out the window. Charlotte! Shit. There was a loud flapping noise, then a winged horse came into view just outside the window. I swallowed hard, taken aback by the sudden appearance of a high beast. This meant we were dealing with nobles. The kidnapper holding Charlotte got his high beast to spread its wings wide, and they shot up into the dark, wintry sky. Oh, hell no. Rosemine, go after him. Shit, shit, shit. Kidnapped daughter. 
Charlotte's white clothes and the flying horse stood out against the dark night sky through the flung open window, and I watched them shrink into the distance of wide open eyes. In an instant, anger coursed through my body, and I could feel the mana exploding in my veins. It was so hot that it felt as though my blood was on fire. My mind was calm with an icy disposition. How dare they touch my cute little sister? How dare they? Crushing the attacker would have been an ideal move, but he was too far away, and the crushing required eye contact to work. Determined to get Charlotte back at once, I allowed my anger to consume me. I allowed my anger to consume me. I sat back in my seat, gripped the steering wheel tight, and practically started flooding Leslie with my mana. Unforgivable. I don't care what anyone says. I'm gonna make them pay. Wait, master of my master. <laughs> Wait, master of my master. Angelica? Lady Rosemont, I will accompany you. Excuse me. Oh, here we go. I blinked in surprise as Sten looked the magic blade called out in Ferdinand's voice. Something that I still wasn't used to. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Like, wait a minute. Then half a second later, something struck Lessie's roof, shaking my one-person panda bus. Two hands reached out and gripped the side windows from above, at which point I realized Angelica had leaped on top. My eyes widened at her completely unexpected maneuver. Angelica, that's dangerous. I don't want to waste your mana on my own waste mana on my own high beast, she shot back. This is fine, hurry. Get a move on or else they will escape. Urged on by Angelica's sharp voice and Sten looks Ferdinand-esque warning, I reflexively slammed down the accelerator as fast as it would go far as it would go, causing Leslie to lurch forward in a mad dash for the window. Stop, you're being reckless, you two, Cornelius cried as he ran after us from behind, but it was too late. In my fury, I had poured a torrent of mana into my panda bus, and we had already leaped into the night sky to chase the shrinking high beast. Leslie beelined through the chilly night sky with Angelica still clinging to the roof. Girl, you better hold on tight! The brightly shining moon made our target shine with a radiant white light. Give Charlotte back. Sister... Charlotte, still caught in her kidnapper's arms, turned to see my panda bus. She reached out a desperate hand toward me, her face stiff and her indigo eyes wet with tears. How dare you make my dear Charlotte cry? I needed to reach her hand. I was going to save my little sister no matter what. My eyes fixed on the white horse. I poured even more mine to let- I can imagine this being the finale. Because, I mean, they're going to finish the arc in, uh, at the end of the season. So this will probably be around the season finale. Whenever we get to this point. The black clad kidnapper turned around. His face was almost entirely covered, but his eyes revealed a sickening sneer. At first, as though he was mocking Charlotte's cries for help. But upon seeing me, he yelped, jerked in surprise. What, what in the world? That wingless grunt flying? But how? He yelled, the panic clear in his voice. The confident sneer from just moments ago had now been replaced with pure shock. Ha 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 ha, you gonna get it now? It seemed that he hadn't known my panda bus could fly just like a normal high beast. Whether this was because he had only ever seen me using it in the castle halls, or because he had received his information from the castle scholars, I wasn't sure. But either way, this was a sure sign that he didn't have much to do with the Archducal family's retainers who spent time in the Northern building. You'll suffer for this, I shouted in a rage, blasting Leslie ever forward. The man tried to speed up his high beast as much as possible to escape me, but so I sped up as well. I was getting closer and closer. Sister, help me! The man looked back to check where I was, his eyes now overcome with fear. He turned his head again and again, looking between Charlotte and me as I rapidly closed the distance. But before I could catch him, he clicked his tongue. After quickly adjusting his grip on Charlotte, he tossed her to the side and into the air before turning slightly and shooting away in the opposite direction. So essentially, he's making you choose. Do you save Charlotte or do you go after him? Save Charlotte. Charlotte's indigo eyes widened in shock, her white clothes fluttering and she sailed through the air. It had happened to me several, many times now that I knew exactly what she was feeling. The unusual sensation of weightlessness and the suddenly overwhelming fear... I immediately turned Leslie's steering wheel, aiming straight for her. Charlotte! Rescuing her was my priority. The black-clad man would get away, but that didn't matter. Capturing him was a job for the knights. I darted at full speed toward my little sister, only for Sten look to cry out a warning. No, master, my master, you will crash into her. Huh? I hurriedly slammed my foot down on the brake upon realiz realizing that Sten look was right. Leslie's first shot up as he came to an erupt halt. The entire panda bus lurching forward from the sun stopped. An instant later, Angelica leaped from the roof. What? Well, Angelica? Don't worry, I'm using physical enhancements right now. She twisted her body, tackling Charlotte in midair and hugging her tightly. Charlotte immediately wrapped her arms around her savior's back, desperately clinging to her. Target secured, Angelica cried. The relief of not having slammed my high beast into Charlotte, the joy of my little sister having been safely rescued, and my gratitude for Angelica's expert moves all stirred within my heart like a maelstrom. Angelica, that was incredible, I yelled. Waving both my hands and gratitude, but before my very eyes, the two of them continued with the same momentum, moving away from me and toward the trees below. 
What is the plan, Master Stanlock asked Angelico. As we are now, we will fall to the ground with the young woman. I don't know, she responded. And there went my joy. The blood drained from my face in an instant. Well, you didn't plan ahead, Angelica, I cried. Not at all, came her lively response as she continued to plummet. It seemed that her only thought had been to secure in Charlotte's person. Am um, I... Someone help! I leaned out the window to see how far they had fallen, ready to dive down and Leslie to try and grab them. Before I could, a wolf-like high beast sped out right behind me. I'll make it Cornelius cry as he shot past, having caught up, to on, caught up to us on his high beast. He charged straight toward the fall, rapidly falling Angelica and Charlotte. Cornelius, you can do it! I watched with sweaty palms as he continued, quickly caught up to them at max speed. He flew next to them, grabbing Angelica by the cape and swinging her and Charlotte onto his high beast. Having stopped their fall, he made sure that they were both sitting securely behind him. Ah, uh, Cornelius, you're so cool. Abruptly stopping in the middle of such a rapid descent would have been dangerous, so Cornelius kept moving toward the ground while gradually shifting his high beast about. He then made a big leap before, loop before rising back up and heading my way. His flying appeared to have been stabilized, which meant that everyone was finally safe. Yes, yes, amazing! I clapped my hands in joy when Leslie suddenly lurched forward again. I wasn't touching the steering wheel, nor had I pushed down on the accelerator, but he nonetheless started to tilt backwards. What? I was knocked back into my seat, having no idea what was going on. It was like my panda bus was being dragged down by something. I blinked in confusion and grabbed the steering wheel, stopping on the accelerator in an attempt to get Leslie back, back to normal. What? Hello? What ha what's happening? His feet started to move, but then they abruptly stopped again as though something had wrapped around them. We were being pulled down and away against our will. Wait, wait, what? What's going on? We're going down. Eek! Rosemine Cornelius yelled in surprise as he saw my panda bus starting plummeting toward the, for the forest surrounding the castle. Cornel Charlotte and Angelica were screaming behind him. I screamed too, desperately clutching the steering wheel, but just before I reached the forest, the moon illuminated a thin net of light that was covering my high beast. Goosebumps rose on my skin the second I realized that this wasn't my panda bus breaking down. A malicious actor had captured me. Looking around in a panic, I saw someone in the shadow of the trees pulling the mana net. It was one of the kidnapper's allies. I couldn't quite make him out, but his dark hands were visible thanks to the illuminated web. I have to escape, I thought, but at that moment, the net was pulled even harder than before, jerking both Leslie and me down hard. We smacked into a bunch of trees before finally slamming into the ground with a huge crash. Ow. The impact was weaker than I thought, but I was launched up into the air and thrown all over the inside of my panda bus. I really should have fastened my seatbelt, and I was starting to realize just how much I would need to invest in an airbag. <laughs> But those thoughts only distracted me from the pain for a brief moment. I pulled myself up to stand beside inside Leslie, who had fallen on his side, which naturally meant that my upper body stuck, upper half stuck up out the window. Eep, the moment I was on my feet, bands of light shot out and wrapped around me. I could trace them back to another black-clad man, this one wearing wielding a staff. Thoughts of when Ferdinand had used similar bands to restrain Bezin wants them to grab me during the snakestorm hunt flashed through my mind, and in an instant my assailant yanked me to him like a rag snagged fish. He pulled so violently that I practically threw the, flew through the air. I could see Leslie return to a face stone out of the corner of my eye, either due to my focus and mana connection with him having broken, or these bands being made from someone else's mana. Ugh. Dang it. This is not good. The man didn't catch me like Ferdinand would have, instead just allowing me to slam against the solid ground. I bounced and slid against the dirt. Finally caught you. An apprentice shrine made it being adopted by the Archduke brought shame to her whole duchy. But I know someone who will be very glad to have you in her possession. Oh no, who is it? Oh no! Viscountess Daldolf! Oh god! The black clad man looked down at me, his merciless gray eyes narrowed. While they were the only part of his face I could see, they were enough for me to understand. He viewed me as an object, not caring how I felt or fe how I thought or felt in the slightest. His was, a his was the gaze of a noble looking at a commoner. I was used to that look, though. It had been an entire year since I saw it last. Thoughts of all the dangerous nobles I had encountered ran through my mind. Bezinwants, Shikisa, or Shikikosa, Count Bindelwald. I didn't have any good memories of people who wore that expression. A shiver ran down my spine as I frantically poured mana into my ring. Shit, you didn't get to even do it. Oh, goddess of wind, shoot, sorry, I protect- mm. But the moment I started to chant, the ma man stamped on my stomach. Ouch! I wiggled about, trying to escape the agonizing pressure, but he just leaned forward and put more weight on me. Ah, uh, yes, I do remember the saint of Arenfest being able to use blessings, he said with a sneer, before pulling out a potion bottle and popping it open. I couldn't imagine its contents were anything less than terrible. How about you just drink this? Hell no! I struggled desperately, but with his foot still pressing into my abdomen, I was as helpless as a mouse stuck between a cat's, beneath a cat's paw. He grabbed my jaw and forced the potion in my mouth, the bitter liquid overwhelming my senses. I tried blocking it with my tongue and coughing it out, 
but the man noticed my struggling and pitched my nose. When I ran out of oxygen and started gasping for breath, it finally went down my throat, pouring straight into my lungs. Ugh. Shut it, the man said curtly, holding my mouth shut as I started to choke and looking around cautiously. I started to lose all feeling everywhere the potion had touched. It was unable to feel my lips and tongue. Oh, crap, it's paralyzing you. Great. A sensation similar to the numbing before a dental procedure. I shuddered in fear, desperately trying to move my arms and legs. Rose mine. Rose mine. Cornelius had descended into the forest and was searching for me, but his shouts were echoing from some distance away. I wanted to scream to him, but I had now lost the ability to move my mouth or speak at all. It was almost certainly the potion. The only noise I could make was a weak exhalation and my blood went cold with dread as I realized that I could neither cry for help nor pray for a shield of wind. My limbs were getting increasingly heavy too, such that I couldn't move them properly anymore. Seems like the potion's working. I think it's going to put knock you out. The man removed the bands of light with what I could only assume was a grin, but my body was already so numb that I couldn't move. I tried to at least crush him, given that I could see his face, but my terror must have been surpassing my anger as I was struggling to move my mana about. I'm scared. The black-clad man looked, took me over to two men, waiting by two horses, instructing them to transport me to a carriage, then disappeared into the shadow of the trees. The two men were dressed somewhat like servants, and since they weren't clad in black, I looked them all over in an attempt to memorize as much of their appearances as possible. But they soon put me in a bag, as though I were luggage, blocking my vision with a layer of cloth. So scared. I could feel someone pick me up and then tie me into place. They must have laid me over one of the horses, and an instant later I started galloping away. My body shook, each bounce causing me to land hard on my stomach, but due to the numbing potion, the impacts didn't hurt at all. They just felt kind of weird. My senses being this messed up only made me even more terrified. So, so scared. Rose mine. I heard Cornelius rushing this way, probably having heard the galloping of the horses, but it wasn't easy to use a high beast with wings in a place with so many trees. I could hear his panic cries growing dis increasingly distant. Help me, Cornelius. Angelica, Daniel, Bridget, Ferdinand, Father, Sylvester, Dad, let somebody! The faces ran through my mind, and I cried out in a silent voice. Someone help me. Well, great! How far am I? We're only halfway through this! What the freak is going to happen now? That is just freaking great. <sighs> I guess I'm going to have to wait till tomorrow to finish this, possibly. I will see you all in the next one. We'll maybe finish this.